I'm going to hand the uh, hand it over to Marion. I believe there's an invocation. Yes. So um, I'm uh, doing the invocation on behalf of Helmer, and I thought this this was a great um, a quote by Robert Kennedy, who um, this was used at one of our Rotary conventions, and I just think it's so fitting for. Uh, one, the time that we are in at this moment, uh, but also for Rotary and what, what we do. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends, a tiny, uh, sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Thank you, Marion. Good. Um, and I guess you are still on on tap as you. Uh, I have here that you're going to introduce uh, Dr. Cohen. For yes. So I mean, uh, uh, several months ago, I received an email um, saying that Dr. Cohen was. Um, uh, sharing the research um, of, um, about the Toronto Memory Program. And I thought, wow, wh wh what a great topic. And um, uh, so been trying to kind of get, get Dr. Cohen into, the, uh, into our agenda. And I'm really glad that we have her here today. So Dr. Sharon Cohen is a behavioral neurologist and the medical director of the Toronto Memory Program, which is a community-based medical facility, which she, she established in 1996 for the purpose of enhancing diagnosis and treatment for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. Her memory clinic and dementia research site are among the most active in Canada. Dr. Cohen has over 28 years of experience in clinical research and has been a site um, PI over, for over 100 pharmacological trials. She represents Canada on an international advisory boards and steering committees and is a consultant to a wide range of stakeholders, including government organizations and patient advocacy groups. She's a frequent lecturer and contributes to med, uh, media events, including those on medical ethics. She's known for her advocacy of individuals and neurogenerative diseases. Despite holding academic and hospital appointments, Dr. Cohen chooses to practice, practice in the community in keeping with her belief that dementia care and clinical research are best offered in the real world setting. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much, Marion. Thank you and Virginia for making this possible. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me well, and I'm going to share my slides in a moment. And I do very much like the quote from Robert Kennedy, Marion, thank you for sharing that. We all need to, to be reminded that what we're doing matters, and I really appreciate it. Okay, perfect. So we are at a transformative time now in Alzheimer's disease research. And, um, and yet, unless you follow the scientific literature closely, which is challenging to do, um, it wouldn't be obvious yet um, how much uh, progress has been made. So I always find it uh, very worthwhile to share with the community what's going on because it is a very hopeful time. So my, my objectives are really to provide you with a, a very brief update on recent advances in Alzheimer's disease research, specifically what's new in diagnosis and what's new in approaches to treatment and also to provide or offer a call to action for any of you who might be willing to get involved and engage further with us. We are a um, OHIP funded memory clinic and a research site um, uh, funded by research grants. Um, and we have uh, sort of an open-ended catchment area, unlike hospital clinics, we are open to residents all over Ontario and in fact, all over the country. So. Um, no charges to individuals who come to us and lots of opportunities. <clears throat> so when, when we talk about diagnosis here, we really need to appreciate how far we've come. And I'll illustrate this uh, in the next few slides. When Dr. Alwa Alzheimer in 1906 described the first patient with Alzheimer's disease, he, he was a, a German psychiatrist and neurologist and his patient, August Dieter, was a German housewife. She developed forgetfulness 
progressively in her 40s. He met her uh, and started following her at age 51. She looks much older in the photo. That's what this disease can do to you. She died at age 55 and he autopsied her brain and reported some new and very characteristic findings. Uh, the disease was later named after him and it was thought to be a rare disease. If we fast forward to today, to 2020, this is anything but a rare disease. We have 55 million people worldwide suffering from Alzheimer's disease, and that's on the rise, 75 million projected by 2030. Um, and, all, and here you see some of the more famous celebrities who have succumbed to this disease, generally in their senior years. However, we do know that this disease can affect younger people and about 8% of those with Alzheimer's disease will develop symptoms under the age of 65, sometimes in their 40s, can even be as young as 30s, uh, but 40s and 50s for the young onset type of Alzheimer's disease is not uncommon. And here you see John Mann, the, the front man of the uh, Canadian folk uh, rock band who died at age 52 of Alzheimer's disease a couple of years ago. And on your right, Julianne Moore, who played Alice in Still Alice. Uh, and she was 50 when she was diagnosed in the movie with Alzheimer's disease. So the World Health Organization has for many years now stated that Alzheimer's disease is an urgent healthcare priority. It's uh, a very common disease. It's a very serious disease and the cost of care is enormous, both personal costs, out-of-pocket costs and costs to the healthcare system. However, you would be perhaps surprised that with such a common disease, we are really fraught with late diagnosis and under diagnosis. Only about 50% of people with the disease are ever diagnosed in life. And most of those only after several years of symptoms. So why is that? Why is this disease so hard to recognize? Well, several reasons. One being patients may not recognize their symptoms. Uh, they may not realize something's happening and not because they're in denial in a psychiatric sense, but because the part of the brain that allows us to reflect on how we're doing is not working in this disease in many cases. And so if you don't think there's anything wrong, you don't go to the doctor and report the symptoms. For others, there is an awareness of a problem, but there's fear of stigma and that holds people back from going to seek uh, medical advice. When people do come forward, physicians themselves may lack the skill or the, the will to make a diagnosis and feel they don't have much to offer. And so patients get caught in this web of, of delays and, and sort of a circular, never getting to a diagnosis until there's some crisis that makes it obvious there's a problem. Early symptoms, uh, which are the most important time to recognize something's brewing because when the disease is early, there's more we can do. However, the early symptoms get confused with normal aging. And you may well know yourself that everybody feels they have a bit of memory loss. And, and so, you know, is, is there really such a thing as Alzheimer's disease or is that just normal aging? Well, yes, there is a disease and it starts out looking like normal aging, but it progresses much beyond that. And in fact, this is a very long disease with the dementia phase, the part that I have in the green box, being the last 10 years of the disease. And dementia simply means somebody's not able to function independently because of a change in thinking and memory. It doesn't have to be caused by Alzheimer's, but the, the last 10 years of Alzheimer's disease is the dementia stage of this disease. For uh, five years, approximately before that, we have a mild cognitive impairment or MCI stage where people have symptoms. Their memory is not normal. However, they are still able to function at home in the community. They may be banking, shopping, driving, conducting their usual affairs. Uh, and, and yet uh, this disease is brewing. For another 15 to 20 years before that, the brain changes are arising that are the signature of Alzheimer's disease, but they haven't yet progressed to a stage where people have symptoms. And ideally, as in all aspects of medicine, whether it's cancer medicine or heart disease, we want to go early so that we can prevent people from becoming disabled or symptomatic. So we have a window of opportunity here, but we have to be able to recognize who's at the preclinical or the MCI stage. 
So the protein that builds up first in the brain in Alzheimer's disease is something called amyloid. And this is what you would see under a light microscope of a brain autopsy uh, slide in someone with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you would also see tau, those little dashed lines that represent another abnormal protein. So amyloid and tau are the hallmarks and amyloid develops very early. And over time in late stage the disease, the brain shrinks. Uh, there is uh, an enormous loss of brain cells in the order of millions of brain cells. And that's why the brain is so small. Brain cells have dropped out. So autopsy, doesn't help the person. <laughs> it's too late for that person. And can we make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in life when people are still alive and not only in life, but early in the disease? And the answer is absolutely yes. We have the tools to do this. We've had these for the last 10 years. The fact that they haven't rolled out has to do more with cost and, and healthcare resources and education of physicians. However, we have PET scans with amyloid tracers that can identify that same amyloid that would be seen at autopsy, but can identify it very early in the disease in the living person. We can also see the amyloid signature as well as the tau changes in spinal fluid with a spinal tap. And this is so, so important in terms of diagnosis because this is not a disease that you can only be sure of at autopsy. It's not a disease that the best you can do is just exclude other things. Well, there's no strokes or tumors and there's no thyroid disease, so I guess it's Alzheimer's. That's how physicians were operating for many, many, many years. Uh, treating Alzheimer's as a diagnosis of exclusion. Now it's a diagnosis of inclusion. Is there amyloid there? This is a biologic change that we need to look for. Um, and, and the earlier you can diagnose, as I said before, the greater hope for better outcomes. It's like waiting till a cancer becomes metastatic and, and widespread. Well, that's not the stage that's ideal to treat. You want to treat that very, very early stage. Same thing with Alzheimer's. So here's a picture of what a PET scan would look like using an amyloid tracer in somebody who's on that Alzheimer's spectrum. They could be very mild, could have no symptoms yet, or they could have severe dementia. And we can't tell from the scan. What we can see is the red, which is the amyloid lighting up. And we see that there's a head full of amyloid and this person has Alzheimer's disease. Here's uh, what it looks like to do a spinal tap. We do these in the clinic almost every day of the week in our clinic. Most uh, memory clinics aren't set up to do this, but certainly uh, that needs to change. And we, we are measuring amyloid and tau in the spinal fluid on a regular basis. The holy grail of diagnosis for Alzheimer's is a blood test. And these are coming and we're really close. In the next one to three years, we will have blood tests to detect amyloid, tau, and other markers, other indicators of Alzheimer's disease that point to how much brain cell loss there is. So we'd actually be able to stage the disease. So again, terribly important in the sense that we need to properly characterize this disease biologically, not just say, oh, there's a bit of forgetfulness or there's a lot of forgetfulness. That's not, that's not going to lead to precision medicine. That's not going to satisfy the need to be clear about diagnosis. And beyond blood tests, uh, a retinal scan, so taking a picture of the back of the eye, may actually become another very scalable, inexpensive, uh, and uh, non-invasive way of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. So this might sound like science fiction, but this is only maybe a couple of years away. We're involved in a validation study uh, with the technology called ReadySpec Imaging. The back of the eye is actually the front of the brain and the amyloid that's in the brain can be seen or can be detected in the retina, the back of the eye with a special hyperspectral camera. So stay tuned. This is uh, again, a, another way for individuals to be screened for Alzheimer's disease in the future with optometrists and ophthalmologists and clinics like ours having the setup to take a, a simple picture of the eye. And then there's genetic testing. And genetic testing is important in two ways. One is there are rare gene mutations that can be detected by a blood test. And these gene mutations directly cause Alzheimer's. Now, most of us 
uh, who will develop or, or know somebody with Alzheimer's disease do not have one of these rare gene mutations. So the minority of people with Alzheimer's have it, but the right scenario to look for it is in somebody who has several family members or a family member with a young age of onset of symptoms. Then we do the blood test, we look for a gene mutation. In the majority of people with Alzheimer's disease, it isn't a gene mutation per se, but it's a combination of risk, risk genes and protective genes that lead to tipping someone towards developing Alzheimer's. And the most important risk gene is called the APOE gene, and it's the APOE4 type of APOE that confers that higher risk. 25% of the population carry an APOE4 uh, copy, and we can test for this with a blood test or a cheek swab. And um, for individuals who have the APOE4 risk gene and for people with the rare gene mutations, there are clinical trial options, both for prevention if somebody is without symptoms and treatment if somebody is symptomatic with Alzheimer's disease. So um, we have been in, impressed at how many people have come forward and said, you know, I'd like to have a cheek swab or I'd like to, I'd like to have genetic testing. And we try to make this readily available to people. Here you see Kathy Barrick, the CEO of the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, having a cheek swab in our clinic. Um, and you see the little DNA analyzer. It's an incredible four by four inch cube that sits on your lab countertop. You put the specimen from the cheek swab in there in a little uh, um, cartridge, and within an hour, you get the APOE result. And for those with two copies of APOE4, the risk of Alzheimer's is tenfold greater than that of the general population. So this is a very important risk gene. So lots of ways to clarify risk and to be specific about diagnosis rather than just leaving people wondering whether their subtle or more moderate memory symptoms are of any concern. But obviously we'd like to be able to do something more definitive. If we have a diagnosis, what about the treatment? So strides are also being made. And this is so important because the medicines we've had for the last 20 years are simply not enough. Um, you know, we're glad to have them. They treat symptoms, but only modestly. So people uh, will not have restoration of their memory. They will have a little bit of benefit in a bad disease. Even a little bit of benefit is a good thing, but not everybody gets benefit from these medicines. They're worth a try, but again, we need to temper expectations. Furthermore, they don't slow down the underlying amyloid and tau process or the injury of the brain. Uh, so they, they treat symptoms modestly, but don't get at the underlying disease. And furthermore, they're not approved for that mild cognitive impairment stage of Alzheimer's. So people actually presenting early and good for them, they're saying, is there something going on with my memory? In order to avail themselves of treatment with one of the existing medicines, they actually have to get worse before they're eligible for the treatment. So it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense that we've got some treatments but can't really apply them early. So here's what we're dealing with now. And this is a really complicated slide. Just, just think of it as something pretty and unusual. I'll walk you through it. Uh, this is the current research pipeline for drug development in Alzheimer's disease. And you see three concentric circles representing phase one drugs, phase two drugs, and those in phase three. And there are over a hundred compounds under development. That's good. We don't wanna put our eggs in one basket. We need lots of, of drugs being tested uh, because the majority will not succeed. They will not progress from phase one to two or two to three or phase three to the market because drug development is like that. You know, drugs will end up not meeting the safety requirements or not being as effective as they need to be to reach approvals. What you see in um, all these little colored shapes are um, individual drugs being assessed and the color coding indicates how these drugs act to tackle Alzheimer's. And just in the way of broad strokes, all of those drugs in red are tackling amyloid, either by uh, clearing it from the brain or preventing it from forming in the first place or other mechanisms as well, but tackling amyloid. And all of the um, shapes in blue are tackling tau protein. So a lot of these drugs getting at the underlying biology of the disease. Um, in yellow, you see quite a few 
the drugs in the green and purple wedges here, and these are drugs that reduce inflammation in the brain, which is another bad actor in Alzheimer's disease. And then there are drugs also being developed for symptoms in that orange uh, wedge. And it's important to treat symptoms and to slow disease as with any other area of medicine. You don't wanna ignore the symptoms, they need to be treated, but you also want to slow down or stabilize or reverse the course of the disease. So not only do we have drugs at all stages of development, phase one to phase three, but we also have these clinical trial programs for drugs treating different um, aspects of the Alzheimer's continuum, both at the dementia stage and the mild cognitive impairment stage, and also in the preclinical stage, which is before symptoms, when brain changes are happening, people don't yet have substantial symptoms, no disability. And these trials are really prevention trials. So how are we doing with these various drugs? Well, the latest drug to uh, gain traction is a drug called aducanumab. And you may have heard about this. It was approved by the FDA in June of 2021 for its ability to clear amyloid. And what you see here is uh, an amyloid PET scan on the left pre-treatment uh, and the red is amyloid. And the same patient on the right after uh, 12 consecutive treatments with aducanumab and the amyloid plaque is completely cleared. At the time, this finding first was published on the cover of Nature, that was in 2016, I believe. This was revolutionary. We had no compounds previously that could do this. And fast forward to 2021, with the phase three program being completed, there was enough evidence uh, that yes, this is a robust and enduring finding that amyloid is removed by aducanumab, but also some evidence of clinical slowing of the disease. Now there's some controversy attached to aducanumab and if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer. I won't dwell on it right now. Suffice it to say that um, aducanumab has now moved us into a new era of Alzheimer's treatment at least in the US and uh, aducanumab is being reviewed by regulators in Canada and other uh, uh, regulatory jurisdictions in the world. But it's the first drug in, uh, to treat Alzheimer's disease that's been approved in 18 years. We've had a real drought, so that in and of itself um, is rejuvenating. It's the first biologic drug for Alzheimer's disease meaning it needs to be given by an infusion or an injection and brings us in line with many other areas of medicine where, for example, in rheumatology or even migraine therapy, multiple sclerosis, we have biologic drugs that we have them in cancer medicine too that can act on disease slowing mechanisms. And in this case, clearing amyloid from the brain uh, and treating not just symptoms, but to great disease progression. And aducanumab is indicated um, for the mild cognitive impairment, as well as the mild dementia stage of the disease. So we now have something for these folks with mild cognitive impairment where there was nothing previously approved. So whether or not aducanumab is approved in other jurisdictions, whether or not it gains sufficient traction in the US or comes to Canada, the FDA granted what they call breakthrough therapy designation to three additional anti-amyloid drugs last year. And these are very actively moving forward in the pipeline. They all have funny names. Don't worry if you can't remember or pronounce them. Lacanumab, denanumab, gantanarumab. The map means monoclonal antibody, that's the stem. And each of these have demonstrated robust lowering of amyloid. And in their phase two programs, which have been completed, uh, slowing of disease progression. Uh, and uh, the phase three programs for all of these are fully uh, enrolled and results will start um, uh, being revealed uh, later this year and into next year for these three different compounds. So there's a high probability of regulatory approval in the next few years for some of these, if not all three, meaning more choices for patients more options for physicians to treat patients with disease slowing drugs for Alzheimer's than we've ever had. And opportunities for prevention uh, because these drugs are also being tested in prevention studies for people at risk who may have a family history or some other risk factors, but are still cognitively normal, functioning well. 
And besides the anti-amyloid compounds, there are many drugs, as you saw from that Wheel of Fortune, that colorful diagram, uh, drugs targeting tau and drugs harnessing the immune system to fight Alzheimer's disease in different uh, ways for the anti-tau studies. Uh, we have antibodies uh, aiming to clear, clear tau from the brain and also to reduce the formation of tau. And as far as inflammation, there are drugs under study to reduce the inflammatory reaction that is part of Alzheimer's disease in the brain, but also to activate immune cells to protect their um, uh, um, sort of uh, function that is uh, nourishing to the brain, as well as to uh, clear toxins, including amyloid. And what about medications to do both? Is it possible that a single medicine could improve symptoms and also slow the disease? Well, there are several being studied for just that, and the trial designs are complicated when you're trying to prove symptom benefit as well as disease slowing. That's okay. This is, this is uh, really within the grasp of, of, of clinical research these days. Two compounds, just by way of example, GV971 is a plant-based extract. It's actually an extract of brown algae. It alters the bacterial uh, composition of the gut we call that the microbiome, and that in turn changes the brain to a less inflammatory state. And there's a phase three study open to those uh, with Alzheimer's disease dementia, so a mild or moderate stage dementia, who are not on current background medications, either because they didn't get benefit from those medications or um, had side effects, nausea and vomiting on the background medications. Uh, so this is a very promising extract already approved in China for treating Alzheimer's disease. And the current global phase three study is to replicate the benefits seen and to prove that this slows disease, not just treats symptoms. Another drug with a funny name, uh, simophyllum, is a drug that has multiple mechanisms of action. It alters the shape of amyloid, makes it less toxic, it prevents tau from forming and reduces inflammation. And so this has been well documented in the phase two study that it is able to act in these multiple different ways. The phase three study is now uh, upon us uh, with volunteers uh, joining. And the hope is that this drug improves symptoms and slows the disease as well. So don't doubt progress in Alzheimer's disease. I say to you, help accelerate it if you're interested. People who know this disease want to be involved and, uh, and do something about this nasty, uh, ongoing and serious disease. So what can you do? Well, um, awareness, what we've done together today, learning what's hopeful and what's coming, that's important. Um, but having a baseline memory test, even if you're entirely well, or if you're concerned about your memory and have symptoms, get a baseline. Um, we offer free memory screening very easily. You can connect with Justine. I'll put up her, her um, contact information on my last slide. Um, you can join our prevention or treatment registry. You can explore whether a clinical trial is right for you or for someone you care about. Uh, there are many options, more options than there were even a few years ago, and certainly more options than uh, a decade ago when the Alzheimer's pipeline looked completely different and was quite impoverished. And for those interested in, in what uh, risk factors you might have, or whether you have an APOE gene as a risk factor, we offer free cheek swabs and, uh, and uh, education and counseling on, on risk, which is often a transgenerational uh, set of information because what our parents have impact us, what we have impacts our kids. So we're very um, uh, informed and, and willing to be helpful in those, in those people who want to have information and opportunities. So we all have a role to play in ending Alzheimer's disease. I know this disease inside out from my own family, but also from the many, many uh, patients that I've treated over the years, and we need to keep doing better and better. So um, it's not just for us, it's for next generations, for people we don't even know. And I uh, would really urge you to get involved if there's anything uh, from what I've said, or perhaps that I've left out that you want further information about or want to pursue further. 
Um, Justine Realm, who is a, a wonderful colleague of mine, is on the meeting with us. Um, and uh, we have a we have a department of uh, educators as far as research. So Lindsay Snow is is among them, and um, either by phone or by um, reaching us uh, through our uh, email, we're very very happy to connect with you and see how we can be helpful. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and very happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Cullen. I have, I know that there was one or two questions. So first of all, if I like to point out to everyone here, if you have a question, you'll need to unmute because I was busy muting people because to get rid of any background noise. So you can unmute to ask a question. The other thing is, is that Justine has provided um, a number and a, um, an email address uh, in the chat room talking about the uh, free testing. Yeah. And I believe there were a few questions um, in the chat room as well. So let's, uh, Marion, can you see the chat? But I need you to unmute. Uh, yeah, so I think there was only one question, and um, that is, what is the cost of the APOE4 test? Yeah, oh. sure, I can I can help you with that. So we offer that um, free. We absorb the cost of that. If it is done by a blood test, uh, then cost coverage is through the Ministry of Health. Um, we um, send a, a form, which is an application for cost coverage. We're, we're never denied uh, the cost coverage. If we do it by a cheek swab, uh, Toronto Memory Program absorbs the cost. So either way, there's no cost to participants. Uh, Leslie, a question. It's uh, Dr. Cohen. Uh, my late father suffered from uh, Lewy body disease, and I was just was wondering if the that disease had the same type of uh, amyloid and tau uh, plaques, or is it a different... Uh, Leslie, had, thank uh, you. Uh, had dementia from from. Uh, understood. Yeah, thank you, thank you for uh, for sharing uh, your information. I'm sorry for your dad. Uh, you. So Lewy body disease is a neurodegenerative disease. So it's broadly in the same class of diseases as Alzheimer's, but it is a different underlying protein that is abnormal in the brain. So rather than amyloid and tau, it's something called alpha synuclein. Um, now. The disease is progressive. It starts with a mild cognitive impairment stage and progresses to a dementia stage, but the underlying accumulation is of something called alpha synuclein. We don't have PET scans yet to show up that alpha synuclein. We have criteria we use in the clinic where the doctor says, okay, this looks different than Alzheimer's because not only is there maybe a memory problem and a dementia, but there might be some Parkinson's symptoms. There might be things like visual hallucinations, <clears throat> acting at one dr one's dreams. So there's some other features that make it atypical for Alzheimer's. Having said that, Leslie, a couple of things to note. One is it is very common for people to have both brain changes. Alzheimer's disease with amyloid and tau, as well as the alpha synuclein in the brain. And so maybe the Alzheimer's medicines would still help people with Lewy body disease. Another thing to note, the second thing is with the advances in Alzheimer's treatment in the pipeline, still in research, but looking hopeful, similar approaches with antibodies uh, targeting alpha synuclein and trying to remove that from the brain are being tried. So um, stay tuned. Great question. You're right. It's not all about Alzheimer's. That's the big one in terms of numbers, but Lewy body disease is a serious disease and we need not to ignore it. So thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Lola? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Sharon, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Going back to the 15 years, as opposed to the five and five, um, are there things we who are getting older can do besides doing a memory assessment to, to kind of keep going with a good memory, good aging process? Yeah. 
Yes, understood. So, you know, what, what, what does Alzheimer's prevention or dementia prevention consist of? Well, yeah. you know, the genetic components may not be modifiable at the current time, although people have genetic risks, there are some uh, research interventions that might help, you know, if you have an ApoE4 gene and we can make it act more like an ApoE2 or 3, that could really slow down the disease. But let's say, you know, there's no sign of the disease, there's no risk factors other than age. Age is the, the, the biggest risk factor for a disease like Alzheimer's disease. The older we get, the more likely we are to get the disease. So lifestyle strategies like the following, keeping mentally active, uh, being a lifelong learner, what we're doing today, that would constitute, you know, uh, um, staying cognitively engaged. Um, that builds more brain cells, more brain cell connections, and therefore more resilience against brain disease. Physical exercise also builds more brain reserve. And how does it do that? Not just by making the heart a better pump, but also by stimulating chemicals in the brain. So when we go for a walk, when we, when we, we golf, when we do whatever physical activity we enjoy, you don't have to run a marathon, but you have to stay, you know, moderately physically active um, that stimulates chemicals in the brain that are important for brain cell repair. So not every injured brain cell has to die, it can recover. And also um, chemicals that are involved in formation of new brain cells and brain cell connections. Uh, so that's physical exercise. Dietary pattern is important and generally a diet that is low in animal fat, low in red meat, um, uh, plentiful in fruit, vegetables, grains, uh, salads, uh, fish. <laughs> that is the kind, it's not our North American diet. We love our meat and potatoes, but that's fine to have steak, but don't have it every day, you know, once a week or something like that. Um, so we do think dietary pattern matters and getting enough sleep quantity and quality of sleep are important. And those of us who regularly cheat sleep and always wake up with an alarm clock are probably not getting enough sleep. And sleep is an activity by the brain for the brain. And during deep sleep, we actually open up channels in the brain that clear amyloid. That's pretty cool. It's called the glymphatic system for those of you who like new words. Um, but in addition to that, during sleep, the brain is very active. The body is still and quiet, but the brain is sorting through memories, uh, sorting through events that happened in the day before, uh, pruning memories, uh, separating emotion from fact and information, and comparing previous information with new information. So you get this consolidation of memory is the term we use. Uh, so recent memories can be stored or moved into long-term memories. That happens during sleep. So if you don't get enough sleep, you're not having that opportunity. Um, I could go on and on, and I know that's beyond the time frame here, but um, if you're interested further in lifestyle strategies, what can we do for our brain? Because we should all take care of our brain, absolutely. Uh, please connect with Justine and we can, we can have a you know, more in-depth session. All right, Hello. thank you. Questions? Questions? Yeah, next question. Do we have a, Brian? Uh, yes, um, I have both my mother and uh, an aunt who, who didn't really develop it until they were uh, basically 90 and basically died of it. Uh, but prior to that, they were very active in that. So it's really uh, hard to understand, I guess, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, how to attack it earlier or avoid it. Now, uh, you know, there may be common reasons why they both had it because they worked in an industry which may have had the chemicals that, in my view, might have, uh, uh, have had an impact on that. And I've had some involvement with uh, Sunnybrook with Dr. Black, uh, who you probably know because she's sort of the lead uh, Alzheimer doctor at, uh, at Sunnybrook and looking at some of the research that they're doing. And one of uh, the drugs that they had uh, prescribed was called memotine. And I just wondered whether you know that drug and what, what it actually does, whether it's just uh, uh, a drug that uh, uh, is 
an old drug or, or a relatively new drug? Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, there's there's a lot of questions in there. So um, again, thank you for sharing. You know, I think people's personal experience uh, matters, and uh, you know what what we've experienced uh, in our relatives, in our family, in our friends does shape how we think about this disease and what questions we bring forward. So people who develop Alzheimer's disease late in life in their 90s have the brain changes going on up to 20 years before. So somebody in their 90s actually started in their 70s developing these changes. And we're very keen to identify as early as we can, because once we're, you know, experiencing substantial symptoms, and certainly in our 90s, there are other, uh, you know, it, it's very hard to play catch up. Um, so could these individuals who it sounds like maybe did a lot of things right, were active uh, mentally, perhaps physically, maybe followed a good diet, you know, and they still got Alzheimer's, how unfair. Perhaps their disease symptoms were pushed off five or 10 years and they might have developed symptoms earlier had they not followed a brain healthy lifestyle strategy. So that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. Following a brain healthy lifestyle strategy may in some cases prevent Alzheimer's disease, but it may just push it off, which is still important uh, so that people are not living as long with symptoms or disability. Um, as far as the drug memantine, this is one of the old drugs. It was the last of the symptom treatments to be um, approved. Uh, it is approved pretty much around the world, Canada, US, Europe, Japan. It, is, it was in 2003 that it was approved in Canada and the United States. And it is indicated for moderate to severe stage Alzheimer's disease dementia. It acts on a chemical level, um, modulating a, what we call a neurotransmitter, a chemical in the brain called glutamate and trying to get the, the concentration uh, closer to normal. Uh, so it improves symptoms in some individuals at this late stage of dementia due to Alzheimer's and has a modest benefit. And absolutely, we prescribe it, we try it in the appropriate patient, and then we see, you know, by three months or so, is it helpful? It is not one of these medicines that will slow down the course of the disease. So it has significant limitations. It's for late stage disease but it should be tried to boost symptoms and if it's helpful. And it's, it's quite a safe drug and usually doesn't have substantial side effects. So from that perspective, it's worth a try. Okay, I hope that you. answers your question. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I have one quick question from the chat and then I know there's more than one there and perhaps what we can do is send you the questions that we get. Sure, sure. So Happy the to. last one I have is how young is too young for memory testing? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if, if one has a family history of Alzheimer's disease or memory symptoms oneself, then there's no too young. Let's get a baseline memory test. Let's see if, you know, if you're worried about your memory, you should get it checked. Just like, you know, if you have chest pain, well, you're kind of young maybe for heart disease, depending how old you are, but let's, let's find out what it is. So, um, so we don't uh, restrict our, you know, offering a free memory testing by age. Um, if So I, maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, I think okay. that would be fair. Okay, I would, so I have the pleasure of thanking you. Um, I'm sure we could go on for another 15 or 20 minutes or an hour or two with questions uh, that people have. And maybe that's the basis, it could be a basis for another lunchtime talk. Um, and certainly you've provided uh, a number and, and email contact for anyone who is interested. So thank you very much. Um, I, I think it's just, it's lovely to be informed about uh, the current, um, you know, uh, current things that are being done and also what's coming up and how close those things are. Um, and just the idea that we can get baseline tests. I think all of those things are great. And I, I would personally, what I valued also was, uh, okay, what can I do right now? Like, what's the healthy brain, you know? So golfers, you're, you, congratulations. You're, you're out there helping your, uh... so with that, I would like to thank you for being here and
Thank you so much, Virginia. Really a pleasure to join you. I'm going to sign off and, and get to work here in the clinic. It was just lovely spending time with you and your members, and I wish everybody well, and let's get through the winter, and please, please, if there's anything we can do, any questions we can answer, we're here for you.